Northridge Presbyterian, it is such a joy to be with you all today. My name is Sarah R. and I am the Associate Pastor for Youth and Young Adults at Preston Hollow Presbyterian Church. I have had the honor of knowing and admiring Betsy for several years now, having first met her at Columbia Theological Seminary. So I was absolutely delighted when you all called her to Dallas, Texas. Thank you for calling her. And thank you for including me in your worship today. It's a joy to be here. This month, you all have been studying Christian phrases and cliches, which is a topic with a lot of room for conversation. For example, there is a comedian named John Christ who has an entire bit on the different phrases Christians can use just to say no. John Chris jokes when people become a Christian, not only do we get God's saving grace and eternal love, but we also get access to a whole list of ways to say no that makes us sound spiritual while simultaneously turning someone down. Some of the phrases he jokes about are, I don't think it's in God's will, or it's just not God's timing. There's it's a closed door, or I don't really feel the spirit leading on this one. I'm just not in that season. And then there's my all-time favorite. Let me pray about it and get back to you. We, as people of faith, have a lot of catchphrases and cliches. Sometimes those phrases are wonderful phrases like, what would Jesus do, which is a question that has inspired generations into more faithful action. Other times, the phrases of our faith can cause harm or concern if not used carefully. Phrases like, everything happens for a reason, or God won't give you more than you can handle. The phrase, love the sinner, hate the sin, is one of our Christian cliches. It is a phrase that, like, let me pray about it and get back to you, you've probably heard before. On the surface, love the sinner, hate the sin sounds like a logical phrase with good intent, but these six little words have caused a lot of debate and hurt in our world. So to start exploring this phrase we're going to begin with scripture. But first, let us pray. Creator God, we long to understand your word. This world is full of complicated opinions and positions. It is easy for us to lose our way. So we gather here today, hoping that you will shine clarity into our hearts. We gather here today, hoping that you will draw near to us through this scripture passage. We are listening, God. We are grateful. Amen. Our scripture passage for today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. Listen now for a word from the Lord. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and one a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So our text for today comes from the middle of the Gospel of Luke, where Jesus is teaching back-to-back -back stories about morality and faith. 
Jesus starts the story by telling us that two men, a tax collector and a Pharisee, walk into the temple to pray. It sounds like the beginning of a joke because these two characters are so drastically different, but they don't walk into a bar and the punchline is far more serious than funny. Jesus tells us this story to teach us something. So the Pharisee and the tax collector walk into the temple and the Pharisee who would have been viewed as the most religiously devout in this story He begins praying to God with an arrogance that I cannot even imagine summoning up in a conversation with the divine. The Pharisee says, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. That's it. That's the whole prayer. There's no amen. There's no forgive me my sins as I forgive my debtors. There's no thank you for the food in my belly and the roof over my head. There's no guide my feet while I run this race. It's literally two sentences. Thank you, God, that I am not like all these other terrible people. And don't forget, God, I'm winning this religion game. If you're wondering, this is definitely not the prayer we teach our children in Sunday school. So there's no doubt that the Pharisees' self-righteousness is baffling. But I actually don't think that's the worst part of the prayer. I think the most hurtful part of this prayer is the way the Pharisee sees those around him as being defined by their sin. Did you notice that the Pharisee did not pray for those who have robbed. He prayed for those who are robbers. The Pharisee views his neighbors not as people who have done evil acts from time to time, but as people who are evildoers. They have not committed adultery. They are adulterers. They are tax collectors. The Pharisee views his neighbors as sinful and is unable to get past that limited frame. Friends, I think this is the trap of love the sinner, hate the sin. The phrase love the sinner, hate the sin originated from St. Augustine, who was a bishop in North Africa in the fourth and fifth century. In a letter to a community of nuns, he encouraged them to remain chaste by living with love for mankind and hatred of sins. Many generations later, Mahatma Gandhi picked up this phrase in his 1929 autobiography saying, hate the sin, but not the sinner. What's interesting though, is that Gandhi went on to say, hate the sin, but not the sinner is a precept which, though easy to understand, is rarely practiced. And that is why the poison of hatred spreads in the world. In other words, I think Gandhi was saying, love the sinner, hate the sin, makes sense logically, but it's impossible to enact. Due to the limitations of our human spirit, we cannot love the sinner and hate the sin. Like the Pharisee, we just end up viewing our neighbors through the limited frame of perceived sin. Imagine with me, if we were all together gathered in this beautiful sanctuary and I told you to look around the room and love everyone who had received a speeding ticket in the last year, All of you would start sizing up your neighbors, trying to remember who had cruised through the church parking lot a little too fast the last time you were here. No longer would you be looking at your neighbor with complete acceptance and grace. You would be looking for the bad drivers in the room because I had told you they were there. This is the failing of love the sinner, hate the sin, and this is the trap that the Pharisee falls into. When we tell our minds to look for the sin in others, we will surely find something to disagree with. 
But I don't think God put us on this earth to judge. And Jesus makes that clear in this story. Shortly after the Pharisees' prayer, Jesus turns the focus to the tax collector who is praying humbly on his own and asking God for mercy. The tax collector passes no judgment on others. The tax collector does not brag about his religious accomplishments. It's a complete tone shift from the prayer of the Pharisee. And Jesus says to the disciples, it is this man, this man who was just called a sinner by the Pharisee that goes home justified before God. Friends, if I understand the text, I think Jesus is trying to teach us what Gandhi was trying to remind us, which is that our job on this earth is not to spend our energy finding things to hate in one another. There is enough suffering in this world. We don't need to add to it. Our job, our call, is to love our neighbors as ourselves. That is always easier said than done. I heard a story recently listening to Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People that reminded me of this moment with the Pharisee. In the opening pages of the book, Stephen tells a story of being on a crowded and a cramped subway in New York City. The subway car is full, but it's quiet. People are respecting each other's spaces. Headphones are in. Some are reading the paper. It's calm, an ideal New York metro experience. And then, and then, two small children and their dad walk in. The kids immediately begin making a mess. They are running around the subway car. They are pulling newspapers off people's laps. They are bumping into people and screaming and completely disregarding the quiet and peace that was there just a few seconds before. This carries on for several minutes, and as it does, the dad, who happened to sit right next to Stephen, is leaning back in his seat with his hat over his eyes, appearing completely oblivious to the chaos at hand. The car grows increasingly and visibly tense as people grow more and more frustrated that the dad is not responding to the chaos. And you can imagine them muttering to themselves, thank you, God, that I am not like one of those parents. One stop goes by. Two stops go by. The ruckus continues until finally Stephen is so livid at this dad's complete lack of parenting that he decides he has to call him out. He taps the man on the arm and says, excuse me, sir, your children are out of control. Look around. People are upset. Would it be possible for you to parent them? The man on the train looked up when Stephen spoke to him as if seeing the scene for the very first time. And in a weary voice, he said, I'm so sorry. We have just come from the hospital where their mother died. I suppose they are in a state of shock. I suppose I am too. I'll take care of it right now. Thank you. I love this story that Stephen Covey shared because we've all been there before, have we not? We have all put ourselves in the judgment seat where like the Pharisee, we forgot to see our neighbors as ourselves and like the Pharisee, we assumed we had it all figured out, but this is the trap of love the sinner, hate the sin. When we are spending all of our energy judging those around us, we cannot possibly love them. And that does not mean that we disregard blatant sins. The world is full of violence and hurt that needs to be critiqued. Matters such as domestic abuse, racism, poverty, inequality. We cannot sleep on those sins. What I am saying 
is that when it comes to our neighbor, to the tax collector in church, to the grief-stricken father on the train, to the person that maybe we don't understand or know well, our job is to do our best to love them, not to judge them. There is enough suffering in this world. We don't need to add to it. And any phrase that starts with the word hate will do just that. What we need is to love our neighbors as ourselves. I remember one summer night at my first little college job as a youth director, I was sitting with one of my youth after youth group waiting on her parents to pick her up. We were sitting outside on the curb watching fireflies, and I could tell that she was thinking. That night at youth group, we had talked about who belongs in the church. Conversations around faith and gender and orientation bubbled up as they often do, so I assumed something was on her mind related to that. I asked her if she wanted to talk about it. And in a quiet voice, that 15-year-old told me that she was gay and that she'd known for years. And then she said, that's not why I'm quiet, though. Everybody knows that. I'm quiet because all this time I've assumed that I could not be both gay and Christian. All this time, she said, I've assumed that at some point I'd have to choose which part of myself I could let go of and still live. That 15-year-old on the curb knew the phrase, love the sinner, hate the sin. She had heard and incorporated the belief into her life that there was something in her that needed to be hated, and she was only 15. This is the power of cliches, and this is why this sermon series is so important. Jesus told his disciples at the temple that day that it was not the Pharisee who cast judgment that went home justified. It was the tax collector, which means the message is clear. It's not our job to foster hate or pass judgment in the world. There is enough of that already. We don't need to add to it, and any phrase that starts with hate will do just that. We need to love our neighbors as ourselves. So the next time someone says, love the sinner, hate the sin, maybe stop them after love the sinner. Because hate has no room here. We are not put on this earth to judge. We are put on this earth to love. This is the reminder in our scripture today. Jesus says, love your neighbor. Love your tax collector in the temple neighbor. Love the young rowdy kids on the subway neighbor. Love your anxious teenager sitting on the curb neighbor. Love your neighbor. That's our job. And that should be our phrase. It's all that easy. And it's all that hard. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, pray with me. We believe. Help our unbelief. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.